Hey ho, let's go. Wishing everyone here a happy coffee-filled Tuesday. Hope you're well wherever you are. I am Sean Pugsley Martin. This is episode 52 of Pugsley's Pit. And as we always do each week at this time, we ask you the question, where else would you rather be than right here, right now? By way of introduction, I'm a freelance sports writer for the Albany Times Union, avid sports enthusiast, a big-time homer for my sports teams. Uh, you can follow the show on Twitter, Pugsley Spit, taking the podcast, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, as correctly predicted last week in this spot. Uh, my NCAA hoops bracket has just been thoroughly trashed. Thanks, Purdue, uh, and everyone else, that Arizona, that contributed to the disaster. Uh, but on a better note, we're going to turn our focus to the college hockey tournament beginning later in the week, two days from now. Uh, NCAA, one of the funnest things I ever did. Uh, working for the Times Union was covering Union's national title one in 2014 in Philadelphia. Being down in Wells Fargo Center was awesome. So this is College Hockey Week. And with that, you bring in the best of the best. I'm going to welcome Perry Lascara, CCHA Hockey Director of Strategic Communications and Brand Advancement and former golden voice of Rensselaer Hockey. And Nate Wells, one of the top college hockey writers in the country for the last 10 years, whose work has appeared in The Athletic, NCAA Ice Hockey, Strip Sports, and the Minnesota Golden Gopher Hockey Blog. Boys, you guys ready to drop the puck? Oh, you know it. You know it. Best best weekend of the year. Yeah, this is this is a good weekend uh, for people who love basketball and hockey because you get the most of everything, I think, this weekend. Yeah, the basketball will be fun. I I, I covered the the uh, Midwest Regional down uh, down in Albany last week. It was a great time, great atmosphere. What I love about college sports is just it's a different field than pro sports. A lot of it is the bands. Um, it just brings something special to it. And you know, the NCAA hockey is no different. It's just awesome when everybody converges from from around the country to to watch some great hockey. Yeah, and I think one of the you just mentioned the bands. I think it was funny because. Uh, out west here, they don't have a lot of uh, visiting bands in in arenas. So when I was, it was a big deal that Northern's, Northern Michigan's band came down to Mankato to play. And I said, "Oh, this is." Like, I got you know a bunch of comments. It feels like a you know it feels like a high school hockey game in a good way. It feels like, uh, <laughs> and I was like, "Man, out east, that happens. Every, that happens like for regu- regular season games." I don't like. So it was a little bit of a it was a little bit of a fun uh, Eastern hockey vibe going on in Mankato. And it was also a packed house. And it was the fastest sellout in, uh, in the building's history for Mankato and Northern for the uh, CCHA uh, Mason cup championship. So yeah, I'm, I'm repping the Mason cup. It was, a, it was a fun game, a uh, wild game as it seems to always be in, in uh, Mankato, but uh, the Mavericks needed the win to get in the tournament and they're there. And the, the CCHA were happy to have uh, two teams in the tournament. Nate, what about you? What are, what are your general observations of this tournament? Um, we'll get into each of the each of the games uh, in just a moment here, but what are your thoughts as they get ready to to go on Thursday? It's a packed field. Just Perry mentioned Minnesota State need to win, and they came back from a two goal deficit very late to pull it off and win in overtime. Mm-hmm. Every team here is either coming in on a very hot hand winning their conference or have been one of the top teams for the entire year. I think, I think you can kind of look at it and the teams are maybe separated that the top five are their own tier, but then honestly about six through 12, six through 13, I would not be surprised to see any of those teams end up in Tampa. They've all yeah. shown throughout the season that they can be competitive against the top teams and they can have a hot weekend. And that's all it takes this time of year where you have, you put together two good games and you were in the frozen four. Yeah. It was kind of interesting. Those conference tournaments get wild. I mean, last year, Harvard kind of needed to win out through the ECA season. They did. And then this year, Colgate just absolutely blows a chance for home ice and, and a bye week in the ECAC by not getting the, the points they needed at Yale and Brown, 10 and 11 seeds in the ECAC. And then they, they get hot at the right time. They sweep St. Lawrence and go up to Lake Placid last weekend and, of all people, the Colgate Raiders are in this tournament. It, it just speaks to the unpredictability, I think, of hockey where anything can happen, and that's that's what makes it so awesome. 
It really does. And yeah, just, I mean, every conference tournament had some sort of drama, some sort of action. Uh, I think there were the majority of the games this past week and went to overtime all except for a couple were uh, one goal games. And even the ones that weren't were basically empty netters were the ones that took it away. Uh, we had seven seeds that were vying for titles. We Colgate ended up being the lowest one and one in the ECAC. Uh, I mean, Perry was in the building for the CCHA madness. So just if, if, if the conference tournament weekend is the precursor to this one, we are, we're in good hands. I yeah, mean, absolutely. Go ahead, Sean. No, go ahead, Perry. Yeah, go I was going to say, no, I mean, Northern very easily could be in this thing, and they were one of the hottest teams in the country. They're, I think, one nine of the last ten going into the uh, CCHA championship. Uh, so it really could have been, you know, two. it would have been two anyway because, of course, Michigan Tech, who got beat by Northern in the semifinals at home, um, is also in this tournament, and they have probably one of the, uh, one of the best goalies, uh, one of the top three goalies in the country, and he's one of the Richter finalists in Blake Piedela. Um, but you have him and Peretz and Levi. Um, so, uh, you know, it's uh, it's certainly going to be interesting. We, we look, at, I know someone talked about how um, goaltending is so huge in the NCAA tournament. The teams that win give up very few goals. It's tough to give up, you know, two or fewer goals a game if you don't have, you know, elite goaltending because all yeah. these teams are good. All these teams can score, right? So I think having that elite goalie is going to set you a little bit ahead when the game starts and that you have to obviously have to meet the, the intensity of the other team. But I think having those goalies with, with your with Quinnipiac or Michigan tech, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a, a leg up on some of the other teams that maybe don't know, or a little bit shaky in, in the back line there. So. Hey, let's bring in the brackets here. Um, we can, we can start up uh, with, with number one, Minnesota. And Nate, you could probably speak about the Gophers a little better than the rest of us. What, you know, they, they should handle Canisius, but you never know, right? See RIT from a few years ago. Um, but that's a tough bracket. Minnesota State was was close to a national title last year. What, uh, what, what would have to happen here for the Gophers not to be heading to Tampa? I think the Gophers have the most ways to win out of this bracket. It is tough because they are face um, – obviously, being the number one overall, I think in this Canisius team – is probably the easiest matchup of the entire tournament. That doesn't mean that it's an automatic win. Uh, we see number one overall seed, St. Cloud State lost two years in a row in 2019, 2020, or 2018-2019 to the uh, Atlantic Hockey Champion. Um, Minnesota State lost as a number one overall in 2015. So it's not always a given that uh, the, six, the one beats the 16. Minnesota has depth. They have one of the top lines, if not the top line in college hockey with Logan Cooley, Matt, Matty Nyes, and Jimmy Snuggard. They have the experience of reaching the Frozen Four last year, but also that gets a little bit mitigated by the teams in the other side of the of the West Regional Bracket. Minnesota State was reached the national championship game last year. They've beaten the Gophers in the NCAA tournament the last two times. St. Cloud State was in the 2021 final. Uh, they are... They, they've been a consistent threat in the NCAA tournament. These are teams that don't uh, back down from the NCAA tournament, uh, the, the bright lights. And they also, both those teams played the Gophers. I've, I've seen the Gophers play enough this year where th one of their big advantages is that they play, teams need to bet a little bit to figure out how to play them. They're something like 13, four and one uh, in the opening game of a series, the opening game of a weekend. And if Minnesota gets past Canisius, they're going to play a team either way in St. Cloud State or Minnesota State that has played them twice before the season, and they're able to make those adjustments. They know the Gophers. What, what's, the, what's the atmosphere like in those those barns when Minnesota and Minnesota State get together? It's it's very passionate. Uh, Any time that Minnesota goes to another barn, either either hosts an in-state Minnesota school or goes to a visiting barn for a lot of these teams. It's the big weekend um, where you have fans who have grown up either cheering for the Gophers or cheering against the Gophers. Either way, they're, they're, the, they're the team from the, uh, the twin cities um, until St. Thomas joined uh, two seasons ago. They're the only team, in the twin cities where about half or half of the population in the state of Minnesota lives. 
And everyone kind of, you, you have an opinion of the Gophers one way or another, either you love the Gophers or you hate the Gophers. And that can't be said for other teams in the, in the state of Minnesota. So yeah. for, for most of these teams, the Gophers are the top or the other top rival. It may not be on the other side that Minnesota sees them there, but it still always ends up being very passionate, very physical, very um, well-played hockey. Perry, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on these uh, these two matchups here in, it, up in Fargo? It's funny that Nate said that because I'm probably the only Minnesota neutral uh, person on earth But because uh, I grew up a Gopher fan and then went to RPI and then uh, had to shed the – I, I couldn't be fans of, of, of both. But, uh, no, it is, uh, it is very interesting. Minnesota State did split with the Gophers early this year, as Nate mentioned. Uh, they, they all play each other regular season because they're, you know, they're – you know, top uh, tier non-conference games to get on the schedule, whether it's St. Cloud or Bemidji uh, or Duluth. Um, and actually, I think uh, if I'm remembering this correctly, Minnesota went to Bemidji for a mid-season exhibition game and it was their their biggest crowd of the year <laughs> for a game that didn't even count. So that's how big <laughs> that's how big the Gophers are as far as traveling around the state. So when they're all in Fargo together, it's really going to be a party. I think you know, there, there was some, I think there was some complaints about having all the Minnesota teams together, but I, there's also some d- very big upside to having that situation there. And, uh, you know, with, no, with North Dakota not making the tournament, there's going to be some, uh, I think there's a lot of tickets that are being held right now by North Dakota fans. We'll see how that plays out, but uh, <laughs> that it's going to be a, a bloodbath in both of those, you know, the, the St. Cloud State Minnesota game, because of course there's familiarity there. And then if, and if Minnesota gets past Canisius, uh, there's that second game, that regional final is going to be, or no matter who's in it, is going to be is going to be really crazy. But uh, I do want to say about Canisius, I think they have 15 uh, grad seniors and grad students. You know, a couple of former RPI players on that group. Uh, I know Coach Large, who's led them this all this way. He's a you know a former assistant for Dave Smith, who is now the head coach at RPI. That is a really cool story um, for the Golden Griffins that they've, that have done there. They've Obviously, had an up and down season at twenty and eighteen, but they got hot. They've gotten hot at the right time, and uh, I think they could cause problems because of their, you know, their veteran, their veteran players they have on this team that have been around, you know, been around college hockey at least for a long time, and uh, you know, they probably don't have the talent of Minnesota, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what they're able to maybe pull off on uh, on that Thursday. I have Minnesota getting out of this weekend and uh, moving on. What what about the two of you? I have Minnesota as well. I wouldn't be surprised to see Minnesota State or St. Cloud State. They're both are excellent at playing a defensive style game and limiting opportunities. Um, what I've seen from Minnesota this year is they're very good at limiting mistakes and taking advantage of teams when they make one. Um, and they've shown it at times when playing both teams this year. I think the, the Minnesota State team that uh, the Gophers played at the beginning of the season, they're certainly a different team. I have had it was like the second or third week of the season. Um, the those games were clo- those games were close as were the uh, the St. Cloud State Minnesota games as well. But for me, I think the Gophers have the most ways to get through. But it all comes down to just who's playing the best goaltending, who has the best defense. How about you, Perry? Yeah, I see Minnesota State if, if they do get past St. Cloud, which I think they will. They'll, they'll pose another really big threat to. Uh, the Gophers, just the way they've been playing. They've been playing a lot of close games right down the stretch. Seemingly from January 1st on, I think they only have three losses. I think it's 14-3-1 and one or something. Maybe 15-3-1 no, and one after last week. I think it's just a matter of they have, you know, they, every, everything they've been is basically a playoff game to try and get into the, you know, the top, top 12, 11 in the pairwise. It, you know, they got to the point where they did need to win last Saturday, which was a, a change of pace for them over the last number of years where they were clearly in the field and was whether or not they were going to get the auto bid. They needed to win those games down the stretch, and I think that's made them a better team than they were at the beginning of the year. So I'm going uh, Mavericks to make it to Tampa once again. Right, how about the uh, New Hampshire-Manchester uh, bracket? I mean, DU comes in. They're the four overall seed in this tournament against Cornell. Then a nice matchup uh, Thursday at 2, uh, BU and Western Michigan. Uh, what are the observations here? And, uh, you know, you got you got two landmines here for Denver, I think. I, I like them over Cornell just because Cornell just doesn't seem to play well in this tournament. But Cornell doesn't really give up a lot of goals, and that always gives them a shot. And, um, and BU's had a nice year in the Hockey East. 
That is exactly my kind of thought on that Cornell Denver matchup for two reasons. One, Denver has been a little banged up the last few weeks, has injuries. Uh, their championship winning goalie, Magnus Krona, missed some time. Uh, he left the frozen face off semifinal with an injury. And then on the other hand, the teams that have been able to beat Denver this year are able to be defensive, shut them down, not allow them to score and keep these games close. And that's pretty much what Cornell has been doing down the stretch. I think they've only allowed like something like seven or eight goals in their last seven or eight games. It's pretty much like a goal a game. And even the game they lost to Colgate is one nothing. So yeah. it should be, that one should be a very interesting game. I kind of feel like it's Cornell might be a dark, dark horse to win as the four over a one, especially over the national champion. And then that's not even going into the BU Western game, which I think might be the most interesting of the uh, first round matchups. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Western Michigan, um, one of the most uh, offensively gifted teams. They have another top line is probably to rival the Gophers top line there. Uh, I, I haven't seen a ton of Cornell, for being honest, but I just know their style of play under coach Schaefer is always going to be pretty similar. Right. And, uh, and uh, so I think that's going to be a tough game for Denver. They, you know, their history in the tournament has said that they, sh they could have some success in Cornell, maybe the opposite as far as that goes. Uh, but you never know in these type of type of games. And then I've seen what I've seen from BU. Uh, they've been kind of up and down this year. Um, I saw tech uh, beat them in the uh, championship game of the desert classic down at Arizona state. Uh, but they, I think they, they, they really kind of turned it on in the second half of that game. They, you know, winning hockey East is not an easy task, uh, despite the fact that judging by the number of teams in the tournament, it might be a little bit down this year uh, just by that fact. But uh, it's going to be that this, when I looked at the, when the bracket first came out, this seemed to me to be the most, uh, you know, you know, chaotic of the, of the different uh, regions as far as what could possibly happen here. Who, who gets out, who goes to Tampa, Nate? Yeah, let Nate go first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree 100% with you, Perry, that this is the legitimately the most chaotic region. I would not be surprised to see either of these four teams reach it. I'm a little hesitant on BU because the Terriers have not been in the tournament for a while. It's always a thing to kind of look at for teams who are making their NCAA tournament debut or for players who are making their NCAA tournament debuts who don't have that experience. And they're, they're going against a Western team that basically rebuilt on the fly last year after losing their entire top scoring and their goaltending, but maintain, but still have several players who have that experience. I, I kind of, I, I've been going back and forth that whether Denver gets through as the net defending national champions, or if it's a Western, I couldn't see, I could see all four teams making it, but I don't know. I, my gut says Western gets through this. Yeah, uh, I, I might actually agree with Nate there. Um, not that I don't a lot of the time anyway. But, uh, no, I think uh, even the way that they went out of their conference tournament, losing two to Colorado, uh, Colorado College there, uh, they still seem like they have one of the most high-powered scoring teams. I think when you see teams struggle to score in the, in the postseason or in, in the NCAA tournament, this team that very much has been scoring all year, uh, with that with that top group and their you know their their back line is a little bit underrated at times I, I i guess the biggest problems i've seen them put up eight goals like three times on ccha schools so i'm a little <laughs> bit a little bit tainted there but uh, i think it's either going to be western or denver going through here but uh, I'll, I'll go western just because i've seen the most of them and i and uh, if they can get that if they get that scoring rolling then it, it can be trouble for whoever they're playing i'll go chuck i'll go denver they're the champs uh we'll go with that Again, I, I'd like to pick Cornell. I've just I've just seen enough watching this tournament for you know over over a decade that that they just something just doesn't happen and they just don't don't play well. I, I don't know what it is. They're a good team. They're a great program. You know, Coach Schaefer does a great job there. So uh, Allentown, PA, the Miracle Raiders of Colgate. Um, let's get to that game in a second. But talk, let's talk about the Penn State Michigan Tech matchup. That looks like a great one. Um, should be a great game. Yeah, why not? You got uh, the aforementioned uh, Piedla. There's actually three of them that play regularly on that Michigan Tech team. Uh, Blake, Jed is a defenseman, and Logan is one of their top scorers. I think it might be their top scorer as far as points go. They have the CCHA Player of the Year in Piedla. He was a goalie of the year. Their rookie of the year was Kyle Kukunen, who's a freshman 
uh, from uh, from Maple Grove, who led the league in scoring the regular season. Um, led rookie scoring. I think he has 18 goals overall. Um, they're playing against the Penn State team, who uh, you know I know Tour Linden on that group, and they're they've they've got the ability to score too. Little underwhelmed by their non-conference schedule. I think that's probably what a lot of people are going to point to is why Tech could win this game, but I think it's going to be a really good game no matter what. Uh, I think one of the odd stats on the year is Pietla has eight of his 10 saves coming on Fridays this season. Uh, and they are playing on a Friday. Not that it really means too much, but I think more than that, it's the rest that he plays every game. So going in fresh to an NCAA tournament game could should bode well for Tech, at least defensively whether they can score enough to beat Penn State and whether Penn State can score, you know, at all, are going to go a long way in in that one. What do you think, Nate? It's going to be really interesting because both teams have been off for a bit. Uh, Michigan Tech didn't play last weekend. Penn State's been off for two weeks. It'll be three weeks, essentially, um, by the time they play. Uh, They lost in the first round of the Big Ten tournament to Mm -hmm. Ohio State. So one of those teams is going to be off for a bit and going to be in Penn State in three games. Penn State is... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, John. No, no, go ahead, Nick. Go ahead. Finish up. Okay. Um, Penn State has been a really fascinating team to watch. They were entering 2020 as one of the top teams in the country. They looked like they could make a Frozen Four run, uh, building up before the pandemic and the uh, canceled the NCAA tournament. And they've kind of been in a rebuilding mode ever since. And they're at the point now where it's kind of to continue building that momentum where they were uh, entering 2020. They don't have the NCAA experience of Michigan Tech, which is a little concerning. They do have home home ice advantage. Uh, they're playing in Allentown, PA. They're hosting the regional. And they did a really great job with building up uh, their underclassmen from the last couple of years. have been playing. I've kind of they, they needed to learn how to win, and they're able to do that. And then they bolstered that with some really solid grad transfers the last two seasons. Um, Perry mentioned Terry Linden. Obviously, both you and Sean are very well aware with him. Um, he's been just a fantastic player for the Nittany Lions. Um, but more more with the Nit- more with Penn State is the they're able to win in different ways now. That's kind of been a big thing. They're able to beat the they beat Minnesota, they beat Michigan. Um, they don't need to win by just outscoring and out shooting. They're able to play some defensive games, they're able to win some two, three, three, two, two, one games and rely on their defense and their goal tending and kind of find the what the smart ways to uh take advantage of other teams this one more than anything i'm not sure who's going to win i think you could really make a case for either team so it it's funny because uh, i asked this morning to people what game are you most excited to see um for once not including your team this is the only one that no one said anything and for me this is the one that i am so yeah well it includes a ccha team so i'm definitely going to be watching closely um but uh <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, I know I learned tech. I think tech and RPI, we, we, you know, where I worked for for 15 years, um, there are a lot of similarities there as far as the, the history. Uh, it's been a while since if either have had a national champion. I think it's been actually been longer for tech in the late 70s than RPI in 84. Uh, but they're both obviously the obvious connection is technological technological universities with strong hockey tradition. Uh, we need to get them to play again soon. That would be fun. Uh, but uh, no, I think. Uh, the last time I think we even saw them or I saw them was at the, I think the 2011 GLI when we were RPI played and it beat Michigan. And uh, the only thing that kept the two teams from meeting was a, a you know, powerhouse Michigan, uh, Michigan state team that beat tech and, but their band, the bands played together. Uh, the Michigan tech band is, is a famous band. They have great fans that are going to be traveling down to Allentown for that. So I think it's good that I think the atmosphere with, between you know the big Penn State following and just the loud, uh, crazy uh, misfits of Michigan Tech is going to make it a really exciting weekend there. Maybe maybe underrated so as far as, as, as Nate was pointing out that people are, aren't talking about this, but it's it's going to be pro- probably one of the more you know better attended as far as teams traveling to this this site. Okay, who uh, Michigan Colgate? I mean the Raiders are a great story getting here. Uh, I think the bubble is going to burst. Uh, not in dramatic fashion. Uh, I think the Wolverines is just way, way too much for them. But good for Colgate for getting there. <laughs> it's I've seen I've seen teams beat Michigan. The kind of the blueprint of that is either they're able to counter the Wolverines, they have hot goaltending, or they're somebody that is either like a BU or a 
Minnesota who can actually play and uh, neutralize their top two lines. It's been more and more difficult as the season's gone on. Um, and those high end freshmen and sophomores are kind of be stepping up and becoming more and more leaders, but it's, it is possible. Um, I'm really kind of honestly, I'm more than anything. I'm curious to see how the big tens offensive firepower comes into this tournament. I was watching all the conference tournament games this weekend and everybody was these one, nothing two, one games afraid to make a mistake, just these defensive battles. And then the big 10 is Minnesota, Michigan going back and forth. Uh, just giving odd man rush after odd man rush and uh, just ju making the most out of the big ice of Mariucci and just seeing that contrast and having those two teams have to come back and play in a more defensive style in the NCAA tournament. I'm curious to see if uh, the Gophers and the Wolverines are able to force teams to play their style or if it's just another, if it's, if it's different in the uh, NCAA tournament. All right. Who, uh, who advances to Tampa out of this region? Perry, why don't you take this one first, sir? Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Tech because I really want to see Tech and Michigan play in that regional final because I think that would be a wild uh, contrast of styles, uh, even on that uh, the pro sheet there. Uh, but but picking Tech to to get back there, I think when you look at the the goaltending of Piotrowski, I think he I think he carries them there both past Penn State and Michigan, uh, one goal games or maybe an empty netter, but I think they have enough to get by both of those both of those teams. How about you, Nate? I think it's, I think Penn state might go with it. I don't know. My gut just says it. It's whoever wins that state tech game. I, I don't know. I just had this feeling in my head that uh, one of those teams are able to kind of neutralize Michigan in that regional final. I'm, I'm going to pick Penn state just because tour Linden was such a great person to cover here for RPI. And I'm happy that he's in the tournament and he's a class act. And he's a great two-way player. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Penn State uh, tour to lead the way uh, for the Nittany Lions and go to the Frozen Four. Six engineers. Six <laughs> engineers are in. Six engineers yeah. in the tournament. Actually, so saw that I saw your tweet on that the other yeah, day. Yeah, well, we could have had seven if Northern would have won. <laughs> we, we could have had a whole could have had a whole line and a half there of uh, RPI Simon. players in the tournament. Uh, last region. I'm gonna start with this one, given the two ECAC teams. I. <clears throat> Quinnipiac looked like a powerhouse all year. Class of the league, you know, Harvard's awesome too, Cornell. But I'm not going to go with them here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick Harvard to come out of this region. I love the scoring. I love the goaltending. They got NHL defensemen there. Um, how am I wrong? And Sean Farrell <laughs> was a guy. I had him preseason all ECAC first team, and I think I might have been one of the only guys. He didn't make the first team in the media selections. And he had an unbelievable year before he goes breaks my heart and signs with the Canadians. <laughs> That's a shock. Cause yeah, he had a great year the year before and just he was heralded coming in. I know yeah. it's tough. I know it's tough the ECAC just based on all I feel like this is like the first normal year in a while where uh, you had teams who shut down their seasons and they're still figuring out uh, how to play, but yeah, that actually is a shock to hear that uh, he was not on the first team. I would have assumed he was. Me too. I was stunned. I was stunned. I mean, he last year you got a one. He left to play in the Olympics, and then he came back and got a concussion, um, so he missed some time in the, in the second half of the year. But uh, he's still an elite player. What about QPAC here? I mean, they have the goaltending. They have a ton of scoring. I think they have everything a team needs to win a national title. That said, I'm picking him to lose in the second round. It, it feels like Quinnipiac, when they force teams to play their game, they are almost impossible to beat. Mm. And they are certainly a team that is set up for success in the NCAA tournament that way. The problem where it comes up against is when they cannot impose their will on other teams. And that comes up. I mean, there's four games in the NCAA tournament to win if you want to win a national championship. And at some point in time, they're going to face adversity. You're going to have to play from behind. You're going to have to find a late goal. And I haven't seen that from Quinnipiac lately. But at the same time, I feel like this is a good regional for them. They're familiar with Harvard. Ohio State matches up well with them. Merrimack is a team that did play this past weekend and uh, has basically just played a bunch of overtime. They played well in the beginning of the season. They played well kind of at the end, and they kind of struggled in the middle, which is 
a fit for that tier, but I think they, they match up well with, uh, with Merrimack as well. So it is kind of curious to see what's going to happen with, with the Bobcats, because I don't think they're going to end up with a better setup for this region um, that they would get. And it really reaching a point where this is pretty much ends up being what we get from Quinnipiac year in and year out, where they're a top team, the show it in the ECAC, but then when it comes to tournament time, whether it's the ECAC tournament, whether it's the NCAA tournament, just they're not able to uh, put things together. And it's almost kind of wait and see until that happens. We, we saw that with the Minnesota State for several years until the last uh, two or three where they're doing the same thing with the WCHA and then they've been doing it with the CCHA now. And it was kind of like, you're a very good team, but win a game or two, reach the Frozen Four in the uh, NCAA tournament. And then we'll think a little more. Yeah. Mavericks are doing that now. I want to see the Bobcats do it. Yeah, it's uh, this is this is probably the the regional where I it's kind of like the uh, New Hampshire, the Manchester where I don't really know what's gonna like. I don't have any kind of inkling really. You got Jake Johnson, who's a former. Just to finish off my RPI rant, uh, <laughs> Jake Johnson's on Quinnipiac, who's you know was a great uh, four year forward for or defenseman, excuse me, for RPI from from Bloomington, uh, Minnesota. Uh, you know, great, great family there. I, I love uh, the Johnsons, and you got uh, Otto Ville Lapinen, who was a, yeah. a late, uh, late signee uh, grad transfer with Merrimack, uh, making their run. So, I, as much as much as I want to see, you know, everyone have have a good tournament. Those those are a couple of guys who I, I wouldn't mind seeing uh, lift the lift the trophy at the end of things. Uh, Harvard, you know, all the draft picks they have, they always seem to kind of underachieve in the end. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, Gibson and goal has been, you know, up and down career. He's had some really great years. He seems to let up. He seems to, you know, randomly let in the kind of soft goal, but uh, he's a, he's a big kid and, and you can't be, uh, you can't make it without a goalie like him. And then Ohio state, uh, I've saw them early in the year uh, when their offense was rolling against Bowling Green. And uh, so it's hard to really say 15 losses in the, in the big 10 is much different than 15 losses anywhere else. I think, in the country. So you really can't overlook Ohio state in this situation. And I think uh, that's why this is such kind of a wide open kind of situation where I think we, we could easily see the Ohio state and Quinnipiac in that regional final. And then it's a matter of, you know, if Quinnipiac as Nate mentioned, if they go behind at any point here against, if it's the Buckeyes or whatever, uh, do they have the, the uh, wherewithal of, uh, to kind of, you know, kick it back into gear and, get back on top because they've been playing with the lead all the season. And that's a lot different as you guys know, than, than it is in a, in a, in a tight game where you're maybe down a goal. So yeah, this, this one's wide open. I get, I guess if you had to ask me now, I'd take the Bobcats just because of their, uh, you know, this, their overall play. And I think they, they play a good defensive style that does work in this tournament. Yeah. You brought up Jake Johnson. One of my favorite stories that I wrote, during my time covering RPI was he, he was a, a block shot leader for the team by a lot one year. And I did a story on that and he looked at, I said, you know, what's the key to it? He goes, I love blocking shots. I'm like, that's, that's special in hockey because uh, <laughs> that puck hurts. Yeah. He's yes. turned into a good, he's turned into a really good two way uh, defenseman. He moves the puck well and he skates well. I mean, he's a really a success story for that RPI program. And look at all those, it, it, you know, for an RPI fan, I know it really probably hurts and it's, it stings for to be part of that hockey RPI program and see six of your former teammates playing in this tournament. But really credit to to the program that they have built. And you want to yeah. keep those guys around, obviously. But it's like, you know, they a lot of these guys, who you know, we had uh, Ferner that went back home to North Dakota after the RPI shut down the season. You know, really credit to the development that these players in the program have put in. They just got to keep them around and uh, you can be the ones in the tournament. So I think that's, that's, if you, if there's a, 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 you know, a uh, silver lining, silver lining. Thank you, Nate. Nate, that Nate's my editor. Uh, silver <laughs> lining uh, in all this is that RPI could be, uh, could be on their way up hopefully in the next couple of years. Yeah. I, I, I like the job Dave has done. He, we have a good rapport uh, covering the team and, and he they had a great freshman class this year. So I think better days are coming uh, for yeah. RPI. Yeah, I was up there uh, with you guys in 2020, right before the the world shut down, and it seemed like just the, everything was going in the right direction. Yeah. And that just kind of mentioned with Penn State before, it's one of those things where it just it shut down and ruined it, it halted momentum for the engineers, and they're still trying to get it back. Um, seems like just there's not the consistency. Just the players, the players are still there. I mean, the players are pretty much everywhere in this tournament, as Perry's mentioned. 
and yeah, well, I, I, I keep, I like to keep an eye on them just to see where, what, uh, what coach Smith is doing and just how they're going to keep going and, uh, build, uh, towards, uh, the ECAC. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure I'm loving that we got this much RPI talking to a tournament that they're not participating in. That's, <laughs> that's great. But I know Sean, I know Sean covers them. So it's, it's not out of the question. Yeah, no, I, 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 again, I, he's getting the players. I think a lot of the guys that transfer that we're talking about, I said at the start of the year, if half of them came back, that's a top four team in the ECAC for sure. Um, yeah. They may very well be playing mm -hmm. that only half, but, uh, four of the nine or eight or nine that left. But uh, you know, that's just the COVID times we're in and we're cycling through it and the transfer portals are crazy thing. So, uh, Hey, frozen four. All right. Uh, let's start. Uh, let's go with Nate. We'll start with you. Who, who wins the semis and then who cuts up the nets? Uh, in Tampa. All right. So in Minnesota, Western Michigan, Penn State, Quinnipiac. Minnesota beats Western. I think Quinnipiac beats Penn State. And then Minnesota beats Quinnipiac. So this is that usually ends up being a team where I'm watching enough college hockey over the years where every season there's always like a couple teams where I see them play and I'm like, Oh, this is a national championship team. Like it just the, the, the thought pops into my head. It doesn't always happen. I had it with Denver multiple times during last year. I've had it with Duluth. Um, but usually it seems like the teams that win the national championships are the ones that just, they have the depth, they have the depth on the blue line and they have NCAA tournament experience where they know what it takes to win four games. They know how to limit mistakes. They know how to score and have a second line. They have this, their second, third lines contribute. Um, when you have these top teams, these top blue lines are able to step down their, their top line. You can't just rely on one group to score. You can't rely on, you can, you can't rely on a goalie for four games. It makes the tournament really fun, but I've had multiple times throughout this past season where just I'm watching the Gophers and it's just like, this is, this is the year, this is the year they break, uh, they break through and they uh, win their first national championship in 20 years. How about you, Perry? All right. Well, using Nate's bracket there, I am taking uh, the Gophers over Quinnipiac uh, in the national, in the, in the national championship game. And then in my bracket, I am taking uh, tech over Minnesota state in a all CCHA uh, national championship game with with Tech getting the uh, the winning the rematch of the re last game. If you if you weren't aware, the last regular season and uh, series in the CCHA to determine the regular season champion, the McNaughton Cup champion, and uh, uh, going into this final weekend, Tech was down two points. And you get three points for a win in the CCHA. Tech wins the first game three zero or one zero to go up to get the three points and go up by a point, and then that meant that. Minnesota State needed to win in regulation to win the McNaughton regular season title outright. Tech was <laughs> – you have to go back and watch the video because you're not going to believe any of this, but uh, Tech uh, led Minnesota State, came back and tied it. Uh, when actually went up a goal 2-1. to one. Tech tied it. The game the goal got wiped off the board. They took a penalty. They scored a shorthanded goal in the last minute uh, to tie it again. And then on the ensuing power play – Minnesota State scored to win at 3-2 and win the McNaughton Cup. It was wild. Um, we, we thought we might see a rematch of of that, those two teams in the CCHA championship, but Tech was upset by Northern. And then Minnesota State, as we, as we learned, uh, won the playoff championship. So uh, I'd like to see Tech and Minnesota State in Tampa. That'd be uh, amazing for the league on top of other things. Not not out of the question with how those two these two teams have played, especially how Minnesota State's played in the uh, NCAA tournament recently, making it to back-to-back. Uh, frozen fours this would be third in a row and probably their most impressive based on not having dryden mckay and a lot of the senior leadership they had on last year's team but uh, not not totally out of question especially if they get by minnesota then because that's probably the best team they play in this in this field if i'm if i'm uh if i'm being honest here so if they can get by the gophers in that second game i think anything is possible for them and then it would be great to see tech and uh win another title for the first time in you know 40 plus years so that's the one picking <laughs> uh, I have Minnesota beating Denver. And then in the other round, you know, Teddy Donato played for the last Harvard national title team. And now he's oh, the wow. coach. I think he's going to get to championship night and the dream ends against Minnesota for the reason, Nate, I made you go first was you just supported <laughs> my decision. I don't have to, uh, 
I don't have to research all that. I'll just say, yeah, what he said, ditto. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy down there. So I had a quick thought. I was going to say, Sean, I don't know if you know who uh, Harvard beat or that uh, to win that national championship, but it was it was Minnesota. So <laughs> it was Minnesota. Okay, it was Minnesota. It was uh, the, it was an overtime. The Gophers hit a post. It was at the the pre the, the arena before the XL Energy Center. So. Uh, for the longest time, it was the closest that the Gophers had made it to, or to a national championship. They went, uh, they won three in the seventies, and then they were just a fixture in the eighties and nineties in the NCAA tournament, but never won it until uh, uh, two thousand two. Back to back. Okay. Yep. You, are you guys going to be in a hockey arena this weekend? I will I, be. I am not, unfortunately. I, unfortunately, I'm getting married uh, next weekend, so. <laughs> Good timing, Nate. It is. I, it's the week between the regionals and the Frozen Four. So, yeah, no, you're that. right. That is, well that's actually played. perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll be in Fargo. Well played. Yeah. I'll be in Fargo um, for the Mavericks uh, run at the uh, West Regional. And then uh, Don uh, Lucia, former Gopher coach and now the commissioner of the CCHA, was actually be, he'll be in both. Look, he'll be see both uh, round one games. He's going to be there in Fargo with me. And he's going to fly out to Allentown to catch uh tech play so all right no college hockey here. for me now I'll, I'll be at my 34th annual uh mm -hmm. fantasy baseball draft on saturday all right and keeping Ooh. track of the action and probably probably having a beer or two so. sounds good to me yeah. all right guys thanks for coming on i really appreciate the time and then this is always such a great tournament again because it's so unpredictable yeah. Um, just crazy things yeah. can happen just like in basketball you never know once they drop the puck you get a good bounce or a bad bounce and you're going home yeah that's the thing we talked about all these number one seeds we talked about uh perry had a, a three had a number three seed winning the which not all the question at all the last at large bid has won it three times in the last decade so it's <laughs> really the the tough part is getting into the tournament once you're in there you can make some you can make some noise yeah, we were rehashing a story, me and some colleagues, not long ago, where in 2015, Yale goes to the ECAC semifinals and gets gets drilled. And uh, Keith Elaine didn't even come out for the pressure. They just got on the bus and uh, went home. And a couple weeks later, they were the last team in the field. And a couple weeks later, they beat Quinnipiac and win the national title. Yeah. This will be my seventh regional to be in the building for. I've seen some Seen some wild ones here. I think one of my second or third one was RIT making it out of their going to a frozen four out of Albany. And then last year it was Minnesota State getting out of their region at Albany. Yep. So that the previous, yeah, the previous six have all been Albany regionals. This is my first non Albany regional, but it'll be interesting to see the crowds in Fargo with all these Minnesota teams uh, roaming around. Plus, I know a charter bus or charter, excuse me, charter flight from, from Buffalo and the Canisius Gold, uh, Golden Griffins coming out. So that'll be fun. Very good. Yeah, I, I was in uh, Sioux Falls in 2018 when they had a very similar situation where North Dakota missed, but they had three Minnesota schools, uh, St. Cloud State, uh, Minnesota State, and Minnesota Duluth. So the fan base was just this big mixture of all the teams. Um, it seats a little bit more than Fargo. Uh, but it was really interesting to watch just everybody kind of uh, get along, cheer against each other, cheer for their team. And to me, for a really good atmosphere, is one, especially just because no, none of the schools are within a few hours of Sioux Falls. Kind of the same thing where Fargo is close in Midwest terms, but it's not close really. for uh, It's three and a half hours from the Twin Cities, yeah. Yeah. That's great. All right, guys, look, enjoy the tournament today. We'll catch up to you both soon, I hope. Cool. Cool. Thank you, Sean. All Thanks, right, Sean. we'll see you soon. Bye now. Perry and Nate, great. I worked with Perry for a few years. Happy for him uh, uh, moving on to the CCHA. And then Nate Wells actually um, came up to a game at RPI once and sat next to him and introduced ourselves and away we went. So uh, good stuff. And if, if, if you're not a big college hockey fan, take a look. It's, it's a lot of fun. So, um, hey, before we go, uh, my world segment this week, I just want to talk about the World Baseball Classic. I, it's not something I've ever really paid attention to. I can't tell you I've watched a ton of it, but I've watched enough to know the enthusiasm's off the charts. You know, and then when the players are something happens, you put on you put on the uniform with the flag of your country on it, and people people really get into it. And then I really enjoy the tournament. The enthusiasm from 
uh, not just from Team USA, but but from all the other uh, teams, and everything. it means something. It matters, and the the viewership. You look at the TV ratings in Korea, Japan, and all the other. They're just insane. So it's a lot of fun, and I think the the WBC is here to stay. I mean, Japan had a big walk off hit last night. Um, you know, big final tonight. Uh, Japan and the USA. So uh, I think the tournament's here. And the downside is the injuries suck. I mean, Edwin Diaz, you know, the Mets <clears throat> lose one of the best closers in the game for the whole year. He's celebrating a big win. Um, that's terrible, but that's sports. Injuries happen. Jose Altuve um, with his thumb. Again, it's unfortunate. Maybe he can uh, fill in as the uh, Houston garbage can banger. Uh, down the runway, the dugouts during his time while he uh, he gets ready to play. So next week, we're going to look ahead at the MLB opening day. Uh, we're also going to make the announcement of the over-unders uh, contest that Mike Nelson and then Chris Vitale and I, from uh, both those guys from Ball9.com, we, we each took 10 teams over-unders. We'll be charting it uh, through the year and see how we did. And a message to my opponents in the Tri-State Baseball Federation, year 34 of our great league i'm coming for you from worst to first it's gonna happen have a great day have a great week everyone enjoy the sports enjoy the hoops enjoy the hockey uh even the world baseball classic tonight and we get ready for major league baseball have yourselves an awesome day talk to you soon